Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our very first um, invisibility session. Um, I'm Nicole Rademacher. I am the founder and director of Acogedor. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Acogedor. Um, so it means cozy in Spanish, and I founded it in 2017. It's an intimate project space at my house. Um, originally, we would do the um, conversations or events in my front yard, um, but due to COVID, we've moved online, and it's really been wonderful because um, we can connect with people um, all over the world who have a, a stable internet connection. Um, Agujador is meant to be super inclusive and supportive as a space collaborating with BIPOC, queer, disabled, female identifying, gender nonconforming, and the adoptee community. Um, and this conversation is the first of our new programming uh, titled Invisibilities. It's a conversation series and it will explore the idea of being invisible in society, in family, and in the world. Um, so today we have three artists with us. We have uh, Georgina Lewis, Laura Paul, and Cecile Rivas, and we'll be looking at family and grief. Um, so before we get started with the conversation, I would like us who are on Zoom, and then also those of you tuning in, um, we're gonna do just three breaths um, as we move in to talk about these subjects as they're pretty sensitive and um, Cecile, Laura, and Georgia um, are gonna be really vulnerable. So I wanna make sure we kind of ground ourselves. So if you can find a relaxing position, whether that's sitting, lying on the floor, sitting uh, crisscross applesauce, whatever works best for you. Um, and if you're comfortable, close your eyes. We're just gonna do three breaths. We're gonna do four in, four counts in, hold for four, and then um, out for eight, and you'll breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. So, all right, in through your nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and out through your mouth. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In through your nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and out through your mouth. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the last one, in through your nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and out through your mouth. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And open your eyes when you're ready. So I'm asking, I'm gonna ask each of the participants to introduce themselves, let us know where they're connecting from, and since they are all artists, to tell us a little bit about their art practice. Um, George, your lesson comes first in the alphabet, if you could start us off. Sure, so hi, I'm George. I am connecting from Boston. Um, so hi from the New England weather and all. Um, I'm not originally from Boston. I grew up in uh, two different countries, actually in um, Nova Scotia in Canada and Pennsylvania in the US. And I went to Bard College where I got my MFA in sound art, which is a little bit on the obscure side. And since finishing grad school, I've sort of um, I work in a pretty interdisciplinary manner. I work in um, sound less so these days, but text, photography, sculpture, installation, um, object making. Um, art's interesting to me. So I, I don't like to sort of get pegged in one thing. And drawing, I'm not sure if I said drawing, so drawing. Thanks, George. Laura, you're up next. Hi, my name is Laura Paul and I'm connecting from just outside Seattle on uh, Vashon Island. And I grew up in California, in Northern California, was born in Southern California. And um, 
I mainly identify as a writer, but um, I do have a master's degree in film studies. So I think a lot of my visual art practice as well as my writing practice is really interested in the juxtaposition of both image and text and the aesthetics of language as well. Thanks, Laura. On to you, Cecile. Hi, I'm Cecile. I am uh, living in Girona, close to Barcelona in Spain, but I am originally from Ibiza and uh, I have a little French accent because my mother is French and I used to speak French when I was a child. And uh, I graduated in fine arts in Valencia and uh, I mostly um, always loved sculpture in any form, in any material. I tried them, I think, all. But uh, lately I'm working on ceramics. And I love drawing too. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the group to um, kind of start discussing. We've done a prep meeting, which is what uh, we, a co usually does before these. Um, events um, and all three of them really opened up about their experiences growing up, experiences with their family, also talking about chosen families and grief that's associated with, with loss, different types of loss. Um, George, would you like to open up and you can also ask other people questions? Yeah, sure. Um, so last night, Late last night, as I was supposed to be falling asleep, it suddenly hit me that perhaps a really good and succinct way of describing um, what I can then elaborate on is a feeling or, or an actual actuality of a lack of roots in family. Um, I'm a first generation American and um, my parents were quite old when I was born and um, they were both dead by the time I was 30, but I think really they both started in different ways, both physically and mentally, um, dying quite before the sort of final juncture point. Um, so there's the grief of the actuality of, of not having parents or family. But I think for me also, and I think we, we all sort of discussed this, the grief of, um, not so much a loss of a culture, but an inability to connect to the culture that feels the culture that feels sh should be ours. So I never feel fully American, especially as the fall holidays roll around. I'm always like, oh, Thanksgiving, you'll do that. Like it's just I that is just still a complete mystery to me. Um, but and, and actually Canadians have Thanksgiving though at a different time. Um, but I similarly, because I spent most of my life in the US, don't necessarily identify as being from those other places either. And it's not even just sort of a nationalist thing, but I think it's a lack of um, stories in the current time. So I have sort of stories from my parents from when they were growing up, they're quite old. Um, and so what it is to be, say, English or Canadian, which is what my parents respectively were, I have less of that sense. So there's that sort of, yeah, a sort of lack of identity. And I will also say that I feel extremely lucky because although that's something that I feel, nobody in the United States ever questions me as to my identity. And so that's something that is incredibly important to highlight. Um, I'm a first generation American. Nobody ever questions about me about that. Nobody asks me if I have a green card if I am a resident, all of those kind of things, so. And I think that's it for, I mean, other stuff will come up in, in terms of my initial sort of like word, word spew. Yeah, thank you, George. I think that's also really important to talk about. And, and that's one reason I think looking, I was interested in looking at invisibilities. Um, obviously, um, from how you present, you don't present as a first generation American. And um, so a lot of times when we think of first generation Americans, we, we often, it, at least on this side of the country, um, California, we, we think of Latinos. And, and we think of Latinos that are um, visibly brown. And, um, and so they are obviously marginalized in those ways, which is 
a, a big thing, but it's also, um, I'm sure there's other other things that we're kind of talking about with invisibilities and and how we kind of form identities, right? And how we move through the world in different ways, but also, yes, um, acknowledging and, and naming the privilege. Yeah, and for me, my story, I'm able to relate to that a lot. And I think there's a lot of interconnection because um, there's multiple aspects, but I had known for maybe since I was a teenager that my my dad's dad came to this country undocumented or illegally, and his family was were Jews that fled Europe and went through Toronto and came into Detroit area. Um, but similarly, it's like I present white, and um, there. I mean, I I also um, there's a, it's a twofold thing. I also later in life as an adult found out that I wasn't actually biologically related to the father I had grown up with. Um, so half of my kind of like genetics, I don't know what the, the, the racial component or ethnic component, whatever we want, want to say about that is. But similarly, no one questions me as whether or not I'm American, whether or not I'm a citizen because I am white or, you know, I am able to kind of fit into that culture so nicely. And um, even though my my background and my history and my family history is one of, I think, many Americans and immigration and, and um, aspects of needing to flee or, you know, that kind of refugee status. And um, yeah, brings up a lot of questions of visibility and invisibility in terms of belonging. Can I follow? Yeah, in, it's, it's really interesting because uh, in, my, in my case, I, I am born in a really tiny island. So geographically, it's really identified, you know, you are there and you are from there. But because my mother, she was French, she's French, and uh, she didn't speak any Spanish or Catalan when she met my father they decided to speak Spanish between each other. And it's not even the natural language of the island, which is Catalan, which is another language. And um, so I grew up speaking mostly French because I was going to a French school and we spoke French at home with my brother and sisters and my mother and my friends. And uh, Spanish that, uh, uh, so I, I always, uh, people, Called me, uh, people from Ibiza uh, were saying that we were giddies, that, you know, it's like the tourists, I, like I was a tourist, we were tourists, because Ibiza is a really touristy place. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it was also like <laughs> really weird because all my, all my youth, I had this kind of feeling that I wasn't really, even if I grew up there and my father was from there and my father's family was from there, I, I didn't really relate it to the place, like, you know, when you own the language, you really own the culture. And um, yeah, even, you know, it's Europe and we were, we, we didn't have this kind of, um, I mean, there's no, the problem of uh, being illegal or anything. It's just about the identity and the need to, to really feel that you, you are from somewhere. I'm always really interested how languages confer identity. Um, when I was little, I actually spoke in an English accent, not a North American accent. And at some point in time, I decided that I was not going to speak that way. And I can't now speak with an English accent. It's sounding, if I do, it's just some sort of incredibly mannered one, like Austin Power or pretending to be the queen or something. But I've always been really, fascinated by that, the, the, the way these sort of small linguistic things or big linguistic things, if they're different languages, how they work to confer identity. 
Yeah, I, I think they do. And actually now I'm living in Catalonia and for me it was super important to speak well Catalan because you know everybody speak Catalan and I was speaking like a French person just coming up and I was like, <laughs> not French. I've, I have never lived in French, in France, you know, and, and, uh, and it was really weird at the beginning because I couldn't spell it properly and, and it was really like a foreign language for me. So now I'm, I'm fully in Catalan. <laughs> I think I, I speak it very well. And it makes me feel kind of safe, you know, like, yeah, now I own the language, so I, I own the culture too. And it's really weird because I'm in my 40s and it's the first time like I, I can, and even people sometimes when I speak Catalan, they start speaking me in Spanish because they think I am foreign. So it's still weird, <laughs> even if I made my mind, it's not it's still a little bit weird. And it's the language. It's amazing how the language really helps you to belong or not somewhere. And because we have both here, the Catalan and the Spanish, it's, it's always present. Yeah, as I said so to my Canadian part, I used to be almost bilingual in French. Um, and, and not so much now anymore, but I always found it was interesting too that when I was speaking in a different language, um, the point where you're no longer translating between languages, but you're just innately speaking from that language and how, how it seemed even to affect how I thought to an extent was really interesting. No, you're so right that like the, the language really changed you. I, I really feel like, for example, I speak French all my childhood and the way I build the sentence, like, for example, when I speak French with someone, I become super goofy. I speak like, you know, like a child, I do stupid things. Like today, I just sent us a mess. I, I leave that French message on the phone and then I listen to it. And I was like, how could I say that? It was like, you know, like a child would speak and uh, and it's really weird because it's really connected to that phase that phase of my life like when you you know you say stupid things i know i don't know yeah I, when i speak french i become goofy <laughs> i want to go back to this idea of belonging which i think also is part of the language and a thing called like code switching, whether you're switching between languages or you're switching between dialects or accents. Um, each of you touched on it in different ways and we touched on it in the prep meeting. Um, and I'm, I'm interested for you guys to elaborate a little bit on belonging as you were growing up and how that was, how you felt it or didn't feel it and what were those, um, subtle signs. I think for me, it, like, I think for my, yeah, I mean, it seems like a very human and organic, but I think because of a lot of alienation, I felt I learned to mimic people and mannerisms and, and ways of speech really quickly um, to kind of like feel that kind of bond or connection or hopefully be read as similar to other people. Um, and for me, it wasn't so much with like different languages in my family, but I think also um, like in any culture, especially in the U.S., there's so many dialects and there's such different ways that education and class and so many factors affect people's speech or like what kind of community you belong to. So I even can see that with, you know, it's like I talk to my family very differently than I talk to my friends, but some of it, I think I'm starting to be aware there's um, you know, like class components to it too, where a lot of my family has like deep roots in California agriculture and grew up rurally and, you know, uh, it, it's a very different way of 
of like the rhythm of the speech and and how you kind of belong through communication and conversation takes on such a different texture. Um, and I've just gotten more aware of that. Yeah, I think that what you said, Laura, about mimicking, that really, it really resonates with me. I can't think of specific instances, but maybe, maybe in a weird way it's because it was so prevalent that it's, it, the instances would be more of not. Um, I, so I spent all of my summers um, in Canada I lived in the U.S. in the winter. Um, my parents were professors, so I lived in the U.S. in the winter, and then we lived in Canada in the summer. And whether or not it's really true, it always seemed that my classmates and friends did a lot of their growing during the summer because that's when they weren't in classes. And so they would come back each fall, and it would just be, it'd be like starting over completely again and, and watching others for cues to try to figure out what was going on. Um, because I also, I spent, uh, my summers in Canada were also spent in the woods, not around people. So I wasn't, I mean, I guess there was a develop, just a basic developmental issue that I was learning about, you know, wild rabbits and, and blueberries and stuff like that, but not cool music or like who likes who now or all of those sort of social things that kids are doing. Yes, and it makes me think this kind of trying to mimic when, because when I grew up, my mother, she was a teacher in this uh, French school who was a private school in Ibiza. So we all went there to study till we were 13. And it was a private school and the people who, the child that I shared the, the classroom with, they were really, really wealthy and we were not. And, uh, and uh, there was really like this kind of social class difference between people that were from the island, normally like in traditional, you know, traditional, normally the parents had a farm or, you know, they spoke Catalan and they were pretty poor, not poor, but, you know, not really rich. And the French people that were probably, I don't know, like people that come from big companies with money, you know, this kind of, uh, and, um, I remember trying, because we spoke the same language, we were speaking French, I was closer to them, but at the same time I, I felt really different because I wasn't, I wasn't like them. So I remember it was, you know, you're trying, but you're not really fitting in and you don't know exactly, you, you know why, but you know how to do it. And uh, it was weird because I wasn't one or the other, I was just a mix of both. Laura, can I ask you, um, so coming from me as an adoptee and not growing up with that mirroring with my biological family, um, I'm curious finding out late, later in life as an adult that um, the man who you had looked at and grown up with as your father, um, learning that biologically you weren't related to him and how maybe that changed, if it changed anything from your memories as far as feeling like you belonged or didn't? Yeah, well, for me, um, part of it was, for my experience, I, now a lot of people have had these experiences, especially with like DNA testing, like oh, there's been like this weird time period right now where people are finding out a lot of family secrets because <laughs> of all the, the availability of this technology or science and how how you know you can do it at home but for me I think one of the big aspects was I always felt like I had a very strong sense of self even as a young person um that's just how I I felt like oh I know who I am or you know even as I explored I felt like you know just kind of some self like sure of myself in some way and so that was a big um disruption obviously because it was like oh how do I trust this or 
if I thought I knew myself so well, did I really, what did I really know? Um, and I think it was just such a um, extreme sense of disorientation. In some ways it was very validating because I, I, my experience growing up was that I didn't really look like people in my family, um, where I am bi biologically related to my mother, but um, because my older sister has a very strong resemblance to my mom, whereas I don't, I think people tended to kind of lump me with my dad out of kind of default. And so that was what was so difficult is that i would kind of been raised with these stories of like how similar <laughs> we were, which is, you know, there's truth to that. There's, you know, that um, experience of the family, but it didn't have that biological or genetic component to it. So one of the memories that always sticks into my head um, is that after I found out I was at like the Y, <laughs> just like working out and I walked by the mirror and, you know, you know, just in the workout room where it's all these mirrors. And I looked just at my calves or something. I had shorts on. And I saw my calves in the mirror and I was like, oh, they're just like my dad's. Because I'd heard all these stories where you just make those connections when you're young and trying to figure out your place in this kind of family. And I had to be like, wait, that's not actually correct. Like all these, all these ways I had kind of formulated myself actually, you know, in the physical sense aren't there's it's not true so it was um it's just a lot of disorientation i guess it's the best way i can kind of generalize the experience i'm wondering if there's um and then i'd like cecile and, and george to kind of comment on this idea of grief um, in the adoptee community, we talk a lot about this um, ambiguous grief of grieving your biological family, but not understanding that that's what you're grieving and also um, not feeling like you have permission to do that because um, we kind of, we grow up, most of us, especially in close adoptions, grow up kind of ignoring the fact that there is a biological family. So I would say for me, and this is something that I've only realized quite recently, that in part my grieving process, so there was the point where my parents both died, um, but because my, my father had some sort of neurodegenerative disease, which wasn't explained to me, um, but he sort of died a very, mentally died a very slow death um, for a child who's still trying to figure out the world. Um, my parent was just less and less there and also less and less of him there. Um, but I didn't as a child realize that. And so I think that's something that has taken me a really long time to think about that sort of grief before death, I guess. It's like, I mean, it, it's like part grief and it's also part like, and I've never had this experience, but I've heard, you know, like if you move and you have pets and you let the pet out for the first time, they're like, wait, where am I? This sort of like just confusion and trying, trying to sort of, um, and maybe this is a bit like Laura's experience in a very generalized fashion of trying to find the new parent or the parameters for the new world. Yeah, for me, um, I had this sense of a family, which uh, where we were four brother and sister and my parents. But uh, my parents were really unhappy together. So I think I made a really strong connection with my brother and sister. But uh, I never felt 
I don't know, really connected to my parents. It was really hard to talk with them. It was really hard to be open with them. Uh, they were, you know, always no time angry and uh, yeah. So, but it's, it's the way you grow up. There's no other, you know, no, no other parents to compare you with. And, uh, but uh, when I left the island and I thought I would never come back, uh, I, I started very soon a relationship with my partner and uh, we made like a, a, a really strong connection and uh, I kind of forgot my, my family actually, because it was so unhealthy. And uh, when, when my partner died uh, some years from now, I, I somehow needed the connection with my family again. And uh, I think that's where I really, I really lose my family because they were really, uh, yeah, not supporting. It was really, really weird. And uh, that I think I had this kind of double, double grief from the person I was making a family with and my own family. It was in the, yeah. It's, it's really strange how you need the connection, but uh, if it doesn't work, it's uh, really unstable. Yeah, I mean, it, like you need a connection some, somewhere. And uh, when you lose one, you look for another one. And if the, if the other one doesn't work, that was my natural family. I, 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 that was like completely uh, emptiness. Like, oh my God, I am really not connected to anything. It was a really strong mm, moment. Yeah, I think I especially really, like you said, like this double grief or those layers of grief or the ambiguous grief, because in being told that I wasn't related to my, the father that I grew up with, there was that loss of the biological connection. But the truth of it was that it had been hidden and secret and lied about for so long. Like I wasn't told as a young person or a teenager even it was like much much later in life um and so i think some of the grief was just like how do i trust these people that hid such a big part of who i am or like my origins and my story or just that it, there was maybe so much shame surrounding it carried by my parents where you know you have to do that work to be like well i'm not going to carry shame around this or not going to let their kind of shame color you know my kind of perception of myself or something like that so i think that is part of it i mean in all these experiences it's like the loss comes in such different waves it's it's not that like single event always that it, it, it can happen so much before or after or come back at a, at a different point in time Yeah, exactly. Like, it's like when you, the loss sometimes like identifies with someone or something, but someone. And, uh, and then because you lost, lose this connection, it's like the other ones appear and, and you can see and you try to hold them and then the, they go away sometimes. It's just like, oh, I thought I had my back covered. And then it's like, oh no, you know, for me it was like really, surprising and, and also like just after that my parents got divorced it was like a, a such you know movement like one piece moves and the other ones that went like super crazy around it was a lot of a lot of movements in the family and uh,
I love this idea of these shiftings. It really, um, I don't know how you guys feel about events in our lives and, you know, why they come in and, and whatever, but um, I'm, I subscribe to the everything happens for a reason kind of thing. And so this will shift and that'll shift. And so what does that also shift? Does that bring opportunities in, um, whether they feel like a good opportunity or not? Um, I like this idea of shifting um, because it takes away that, at least for me, it takes away that negative or positive, like, like, like dichotomous thinking of, of events. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, so after my parents died, and my parents died within six months of each other, which was, I guess that's kind of uncommon. Um, and it actually, in this weird way, it's not like I got sick of explaining it to people, but I didn't want that to be who I was. Um, so I ended up, I ended up breaking up with my boyfriend at the time and just going traveling for a bit. And I loved the fact that I was completely anonymous. I was completely in charge in terms of invisibilities. I was completely in charge of how I presented myself to people and what I told them about myself. And so it wasn't even necessarily from a point of grief or pain, but the idea that I could be in charge of, if I wanted to tell people about my family, I could, but they didn't otherwise know anything about me. And so instead I could be something completely different, just this person with a backpack or something that that was how people perceived me and I kind of liked that. That's interesting because I think I've had both experiences where I definitely have had that feeling of like yeah you get to kind of be empowered to kind of like self explain how you want or you know like that is you get to kind of own your story but I think I've also had times where because these events with like finding out about my my the paternity um happened so late in life that there was part of me where it was like well that was such an easy out because if I had been told when I was seven or 12 I would have had this whole kind of built-in community that probably would have known what had happened like it would have been much more something like I guess part of it felt like well this is still kind of being kept a secret because like I'm kind of getting this information dropped on me and then like I have this kind of burden of like trying to tell people or like you were saying it can be such a burden to have to tell stories over and over again um so it can be really interesting like what you're able to get from other people in terms of yeah if they know you're going through like a grief experience or or um how much like that weighs on one individual person I guess This is really, really interesting because actually one of my hardest things to, I mean, deal with is uh, the way I present myself when, you know, uh, for example, because I'm living in the house I was sharing with my, my partner and uh, I still have a lot of things in common. It's really, it's really, I mean, it's really hard sometimes, you know, because it's like, yeah, that was from, you know, my partner, but oh, oh yeah, he's dead. And this idea of being young, a young woman, and be a widow, so it, it's, I can see in the face of other people how it freaks people out, you know, like suddenly it's just like super uncomfortable and the people feel, I mean, they feel sorry and, uh, and uh, they feel bad and, uh, so I, I, at the beginning, I tried to avoid it. And so, it, and, uh, as, and, and also for me, because we were together for almost 15 years. So I was really young when I met him and, and my, my whole life actually was with him and we were really close. So at the beginning, it was really weird to have friends that didn't knew him. And, uh, and uh, also I remember this kind of trying not to tell because 
you could really see how the people, when they knew I was a widow, uh, especially the first month and year, you know, when it was really fresh, that they were really, uh, I don't know how to say, they, they were not natural with me. They were really trying, you know, to make things really smooth, and, and it, it came from a really good place. I mean, I'm really, I mean, I'm not saying it's bad, but it always remain, it always put you in front that you're a widow, you know, that you're going through this experience, and you're really trying to get over it because it's it's hard enough. You don't want to think about it all the time. So I I started to don't tell people. And it become weirder because then you tell people later on, and it's and it's, I mean, yeah, that was like what? And you're saying that now, I mean, and and uh, so it has been, and it still is sometimes. Like, I, I, I sometimes I don't want to tell, but it's so part of my life. It, it 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 really builds something really strong, and sometimes even my conversation they go around death or you know life and everything because it's so present but it's yeah, it puts me in the weird it's really weird and when yesterday i was thinking about these invisibilities so i think like the grief of someone that you i don't know that you have built your life with for so many years it it's invisible because he's not there but it's so visible because it's come up all the time and 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 it's really hard because I don't know, I, I I literally don't know how to do it. Sometimes it's like I, how 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 can you deal with that? You don't want to be something so important, but you at the same time you it's there. It, it will come up at some point. And I think the fear of death or, or dying. But I think the most I, when I see the face of the people is the fear of losing someone you love which is the harder thing and, and it really, I mean, people, I've seen people just crying like a lot just because I was saying that there was a widow. So it's, it's something really, it touches, it touches us, death, and uh, so strongly. It's really, because we try to hide it all the time, but it's there. And it, it's invisible, actually. It's an invisibility. It's die, dying is always there, but we don't want to see it until it happens. And uh, I am making it visible. It's so uncomfortable because you know I'm there, watching the uncomfortability of people when I'm saying it. I've been writing notes as we talk um, and I just wrote down making it visible and I guess the part of me that's an artist is always curious about whether or not these things because I don't think it's a given whether or not these things sort of make it into our work or, or um, influence our work um, and I think really in my case for a long time, not only did it not make it into my work in a sort of ambivalent fashion, fashion, but I think that my work was in a way sort of overly intellectualized and highly conceptual because that was in some ways a way of sort of avoiding the whole thing. And I think that um, in the last couple of years, my work has become much more sort of I don't know about necessarily impulsive, but more intuitive and more sort of grounded. And I think that the whole, weirdly, the pandemic, um, something about that um, has made my work even more um, about emotions. And I, when I was sort of preparing for this, like writing notes, and I, I, I realized that in, in some weird way that the pandemic in, in tandem with all of the other, at least in the US, horrible um, events, um, be it, you know, killings, um, social unrest because of, you know, social justice issues, all of these things. I felt like for the, I share more strong and deep emotions with people 
than perhaps ever before. I think I've tended to feel a little bit isolated by my specific emotions, and right now I don't. I feel a huge commonality with many people. I think I've also had these events kind of force me to have more emotionality in my work. Um, which I don't think I would have identified that I hadn't been, but I think, I don't know, the best way I can understand is it feels like just if it's in the U S or a, a kind of Western concept of like art can be so much about mastery and kind of like, you know, a lot of the ways it's been framed is like in control and domination and kind of like, you kind of like have this very strong like ownership and kind of, um, yeah, you know, that that's kind of what has been praised for so long. And so I think for me, it, it forced me to be like, that's an illusion that I can't really like keep up that like things are really fragmented and like things come at very like nonlinear times and like memories shoot up and like that there, I think fr the fragmentation was so much that it was like, there's these really broken bits that I'm sifting through or processing through art and work and it's going to be messy or like, you know, just have like a much more complex emotionality to it. Um, and it can't be that more kind of stoic, like here's my creation and it's like so distant from me or like I'm not entering into it fully where it's just like, I can only really express from whatever I'm capable as my, myself and my imagination, but um kind of getting more real i think with that of just like it's you know it's coming from me and i i'm you know it's it's from my experience yeah i totally uh i totally um get identify whatever uh the phrase might be i mean it, yeah Yeah, when, when in my work, it's purely shaping ceramics, so it's really formal, but uh, uh, when I started around a year after my partner died, and uh, I was really deep into, I mean, nothing had really much sense at this time, you know, like when you're like going through, and, and because he, he had a really aggressive type of leukemia that had him in the hospital for one year with really, really strong um, treatments. And, and uh, uh, this time uh, with him, seeing uh, how you, you're dying, you know, and uh, it made me, it really shifted my way of being alive too. It's just like you suddenly realize and his treatments were so strong, he needed to be in an isolated room. I mean, that was really a truly quarantine because it was like two and a half meters by two and a half and the bed and all the, you know, Partner, and he's been, he was there the first time for 60 days. No, no way to open a window. I was the only person allowed to be there. And he was really, really good in his head. He was a really, um, I mean, centered person. So yeah, he was reading and we were talking a lot and uh, there was no internet connection and there was no, it was five years ago and we didn't have any smartphones at the time. So it was just purely talking. Yeah. And uh, we spent almost a year with each other talking about, you know, whatever. And uh, I, I suddenly, I, he was an artist too. And uh, he was uh, like, really you know worker with wood and materials he was always doing stuff so it was a really huge change to be you know doing nothing i mean for him having 10 days of holiday was like too much 
he couldn't do nothing for 10 days. So being for a year uh, in a room without nothing to do, except, you know, waiting to get better. And for me to just being there, he couldn't bring anything in the room because of uh, the possibility that it was dirty or whatever. And, and, uh, and I remember that how everything seemed <laughs> unimportant, you know, like, you know, you want to do what you want to do with anything. I mean, you lose totally the, the perspective of, you know, things that you need, the clothes you wear, the money you spend on, you know, going on holiday. I mean, it felt like, yeah, okay, if you can do it, you can do it, but it's not, you know, so important. And, and you know, it's like pure being alive is the real thing. So, uh, yeah, when he died, I kind of, kind of had this thing that nothing was really important anymore. And, um, and uh, when I started back to build the studio and, and, and organizing my life again, I, I really wanted to keep this intensity on mind, you know, like, don't forget that not, uh, all of this is not important. The only thing is being alive and create real connections with people because that was the thing that Um, having someone that really knows you, you know, and because we were talking about this kind of not fitting and not knowing where you are from or, or how you present to others or this identity, you know, like, I don't know if I'm this or that, or I belong here or there. And uh, I truly felt like the only important thing was to be seen like as yourself, truly yourself. To someone and uh, and and uh, so in my work I I try to shape that I know it's kind of weird but it's about this shape of you know connection and love and uh, being alive what shape this can have and I really think about it and try to shape it. I looked um, on Instagram, which is always hard to, to sort of get a sense of people's images, but it seemed like you had some really large pizzas. Is that, is that true, Cecile? I, I had what? Some really large pieces. Yeah, I, 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 the funny thing is that, is that I, when I started working after Pepsi, I was doing like super tiny, tiny pieces like this, and they were like kind of miniatures and I was spending hours doing these really tiny things that fit one in another. And uh, I have a huge studio. It's about around 500 square meters. And when uh, the lockdown started, I, I brought my, my clay at home. And I started to make huge pieces that are the biggest one I ever made. And it's so weird because my house is really tiny. <laughs> and uh, in my studio, I was working really tiny. In my house, I was working really big. And now I have one, it's so big, I don't know how to bring it there. It's, it's the weird, the, the shaping thing is really weird. How suddenly you needed, like, you know, to feel space in the house and uh, in the studio, not so much. Yeah, it's really interesting how people's work has changed and shifted since lockdown. And I feel like, at least for me, that it's shifted numerous times at this point, too. I mean, there's a continuum, but it's been 
what is it, eight months or something now, crazy, at least in Massachusetts, and I think in California too. Um, I, I, I don't know elsewhere, but um, such a complexity of emotions and experiences and world events. Um, yeah, and sort of for me and who, who I am and how I fit into that feels quite inconsequential in a way. And, and yet also powerful because I think of the need for everybody to remain, to maintain agency and, and, and keep pushing along. I think because it's felt like there's been so many big shifts and like there's so much just like move I mean it's funny as we're like locking down but like clearly like the world is changing on such kind of maybe fast kind of on the global scale for sure even though it's happening so differently in different countries but I think for me it's actually I felt more of a sense of freedom because it feels like, oh, like the old way of doing things is like clearly not working at this point or we just can't do things as normal, you know, even like in the most basic kind of mundane way. So, you know, I think for me, it kind of at times really felt like it was giving me permission of like, well, why not try something new or like to take away some of those judgments of like, how do you kind of fit in to like these kind of pre-existing ways that people identify work or you know that it just felt like there was more possibility actually um as we also like adapt to just like well if you can't do things in person or if you can't get the materials you're used to like going to buy at the store or online or whatever you know like there's a lot of kind of improvisational qualities that have emerged for me i think Absolutely, yeah. I'm really excited because today um, it's, we started at two o'clock my time, so I was doing some work beforehand, and I finally used the gold glitter glue <laughs> that I've had sitting in a corner in my kitchen that I had happened to purchase before lockdown, and I've just been staring at it, you know, week after week, like, ah, oh, one day, <laughs> it's finally the day. Um, but yeah, there's a, I feel a sort of realness and I think it ties in a way to it. So I was talking about the sort of, and I'm not currently, you know, during the pandemic or, or whatever else we may call this time, grieving someone or something necessarily, but the, the realness and the, um, the, the, the need to sort of shape things um, and also, yeah, just the, like, forget mastery, just do something. And that's exhilarating in some ways. And it, for me, at least an exhilaration, it seems really necessary to counteract so much of what else is going on. I actually today had an experience about, because, uh, I am, I, I, I don't know how it works in, in the USA, but I hear, um, well, the pandemic is coming back like really strongly. And, uh, and uh, I, I had a coffee with a friend of mine last Sunday and uh, she got uh, the test that she was positive. So I've been isolated in my house since last Friday when she told me and I had the test and I don't know the results yet, but I'm not allowed to leave the house. And uh, I'm starting, you know, to build in my, ha in my head, like, oh my God, this is coming back, you know, the being in the house and, uh, and uh, the not being allowed to, you know, go outside and uh, see people. And, uh, and uh, I was preparing myself like, okay, this is, you know, coming back. 
do you have enough clay? <laughs> what can I do? Whatever, you know, like, I'm gonna, you know, if I don't have clay, I'm gonna get super nuts because, you know, I mean, I think I've watched everything on Netflix already. I, I need to get it out of this. So, yeah, for me, uh, working on something, and, and sometimes I thought it's just weird because there was, even if I changed the scale of my work, and I, I didn't really notice on I, the, um, I've seen in a, in a lot of artists, you know, locked on work because they were at home, so they had to, you know, work with anything, toilet paper, you know, whatever. And uh, because I had clay and foam, the material was the same, and and my shapes, you know, they were a lot evolving or bigger or whatever, but. It was the same, and I was like, I don't know if it can be interesting, you know, change something just to be more in the situation. I think there's something about that, you know, and instead of stressing out because you don't have enough clay, trying to figure out what can you do. But I don't know. Things are so hard, like that. Just you know, bring some clay to make it easier. So I have to look at that. Yeah, I'm thinking, well, really, I'm staring into space, but I mean, I'm also thinking about how invisibilities work when you're not around people. And I mean, I am, you know, around people to an extent, but, but far less so than normally. And so is that a sort of to, to go back much earlier in the conversation to the sort of like the burden of, of things like grief, is it, is it freeing or maybe that, maybe those can't even exist, those, those two propositions can't really exist in the same realm, maybe it's something completely different. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. I know, like, unfortunately, in the US, like, there's a lot of talk with, you know, like, fake news or misinformation and kind of like conspiracy theory thinking where I think uh, if we already had like conditions that fostered that before, especially like being isolated and like, you know, kind of like getting in these weird silos of like, things you're accessing through the internet can be kind of like, creating your own little world but I think there's like there's such like a scary like destructive quality to that but there's such a, like a liberating quality to that as well like you're saying it's like if you're not like having to share everything with everyone all the time or like worried about people's impressions of you or something like it's really fostering these kind of like mini little like incubation places where it's like you kind of it feels very creative to me it's like there are these little worlds you can create um if you're like yeah stuck in your room by yourself or your house or whatever and there's so little access it, it my sense of the world is so different this year just because like it's filled with me and not not a lot of other people as much as I like call people and talk on the phone or whatever or communicate but um it it's a real interesting shift to not be sharing that in the same way or kind of like co-creating that with people like in person yeah i wonder what we'll be like when we come out of this <laughs> i mean one curiosity that I've had for a while now is what our immune systems will be like. But I wonder also, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> this is such a goofy term, but like our emotional immune systems are just how, how fundamentally we will be changed in terms of 
not only how we interact with people, but what happens when we do interact with people. Um, not just in terms of exposure to viruses and stuff, but it just seems that it will be so different. I imagine at least that it'll be, maybe, maybe it'll just completely revert, revert back, but um, I don't know. Yeah, part of me just can't, like, I keep using, like, being at a concert, for example, like a big, you know, big, uh, not an auditorium, but just, you know, hundreds of people where it's like, I've been in that experience multiple times, and it can be, like, overstimulating, but it's like, now imagining it, it's like, just the sensation of, like, how much input you get from something like that is, it's really interesting of, like, is that going to be just like a total shock if that, when and if that like how that's going to come back again yeah and, and the weirdest thing is that it's totally global i mean the whole world is in the same situation and that's incredible and at the same time we are all in our homes you know building up our, our own story about it because i think because i live on my own and you don't have, you know, this sharing experience. Yes, you do, you know, but uh, it's not something that you do every day. And I think we are all in our places building, you know, the reality from what we see or the news that we read or the things that we decide to do. And so I think, I don't know, sometimes I think, is this like a lot of small realities coming up together and you know we are all isolated building up our thing and then explaining to the world and you know i don't know it's really overwhelming sometimes and uh yeah I, uh, the other day i was watching a movie and and, uh, and the woman she just kissed a random guy and i was like what <laughs> And, and I, 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 re I reacted like, oh my God, did, you know, how do they do it? They test each other before that or what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I would never think about that before. And it's just, yeah, I, ho I, ho I really hope we don't get like super, uh, I don't know the name in English, uh, you know, when you get obsessed with, you know, cleaning and not touching. I had this really strange thing feeling to me happen. I went, or as a family, we went to, um, it's, it's like an open air mall. Um, and because we needed to get out and they had an ice cream shop and it was great. And so we're walking and this guy like hits me on the, sh like, you know, we walk and he hits me on the shoulder and I totally freaked out. And, like, I didn't freak out at him, but like ha not having touched or bumped into anybody outside of my household since the middle of March, it was like this strange feeling. And I didn't even say, like, usually you just say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even, I was just so taken aback by that jolt, by that, by that touch. I don't know, here in Spain, because we're so used to hug, you know, Nicole, how it is here. I mean, it's not possible to see each other without worrying, touching and so it's really weird because those people that cannot, you know, you should chop their hands if they do it you know they just see you and they grab you and then they, and sometimes it's just like hey <laughs> i don't know and uh yeah i don't know it's here and the people is getting so nuts now with the perspective of this winter coming so strongly it's really weird it's really, weird. really strange situation i think it's Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I'm really grieving yeah. a communities. Um, yeah, like I'm just, um, like the school my son goes to, we've, there's 
with the parents is we've been really tight and the kids are really tight and we're lucky enough to live where we live where our son can kind of run around. Um, but the other day we ended up hanging out with one of the families and it was, I remembered what that community was like. And I remembered being able to share that with more than one family at a time. And um, I just had this immense sadness. I think it's been going on for so long that it's weird. I mean, I think, Nick, I can't remember the words that you used when you, when you opened up, started the whole thing up, but sort of the idea that, um, that the pandemic has really broadened in some way connection for people. And so locally, yeah, I have almost no connection with people. And I'm, I mean, I'm bluntly kind of scared to, as I think most people are. And yet at the same time, I feel in case in point that I have met people that I would never otherwise have met and have discussions with people or I sit in Zoom um, artist talks or writers talks in places. Uh, the other night it was, you know, a, a presentation in New York. And I mean, I go to New York periodically, but the likelihood that I would have been able to go to that. And so there's on the one hand, I feel a tremendous isolation, but also this new sort of parallel knitting together of points in, in, in sort of space and time or something, or maybe more space than time. It's bluntly kind of exciting to me. And, and um, I feel like there are so many things at the start of this, it felt like so much was going to change. And I think that there is a need for change a need for change in many places. At this point, sadly, I'm not quite sure what will change, um, but I do wonder how people's notion of proximity and distance will change and how new sort of bonds and affiliations can come from this. Because at this point, yeah, I'm an artist in Boston, but I'm still not going to my studio for a whole bunch of reasons in part because it's kind of a pain to get there. But so am I about an artist in Boston or right now, am I an artist in LA or are we all sort of artists on, you know, the wire, the Wi-Fi or something? I mean, what, you know, how is that defined or need it be defined? Yeah, I love how you said there's like that new possibility for connection. For me, I don't think, I'm sure I've had moments of that grief of kind of that in-person community, but I think more than that, it's just been that like my dynamics with people and relationships have just like changed more than I would have expected. Like certain people that I maybe didn't think I was quite as close to or maybe had more of a a, you know we just may want to communicate as frequently like has has kind of emerged more whereas like other things have faded away and some of that is like you said it's like if you kind of take out how we think of proximity physically it's like those digital connections are just like who you're communicating with more frequently um it's been if interesting to see like it's it seems in my life it's shifted quite a bit for me, I, I'm really comfortable, comfortable on my own. I live on my own. I, my studio, I work on my own and I'm used to it and I like it. But uh, I really miss parties. I really miss, you know, this day that, you know, you've been the whole week on your own. And, uh, and you know, I'm build up my things in my head and everything so it's this day that you see people and you just you know let everything out and and i really miss the you know the, the human contact because i like it i like to be on my own but when i am with people i like to you know be there and you know, wine and dance and everything i like it <laughs> and i miss that very much i mean it's really frustrating that you cannot, you know, it's perfect. I, I can be on my own, no problem. I can spend, you know, a month on my own, but I want to be able, you know, just to go party sometime. And it's, uh, there's no way it's happening. In, you know, I don't know when. 
and I really miss that. I really miss the, you know, human smell, <laughs> human, you know, sweating and dancing <laughs> together. And I, and I like that. So yeah, that's um, the missing part. But yes, yeah, I totally agree because, for example, now with uh, we started um, fanzine, fanzine in Nicole, You say that? Oh, I have it here. What did you? What was the word? It's a little, you know. A little I was fanzine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How you call it? Well, how do you say? Fanzine. Fanzine. And uh, we started it just before the before the pandemic. We didn't know it was happening. It was going to happen. And the idea was to connect because I, this is a little town where I live to connect the artists from the area. And uh, and uh, it started. We started, and the first number was um, "Happy End of the World." And we didn't even know that this was going to happen. So <laughs> it was just like, "Oh my God, did we? You know, did we make it happen?" And uh, so everything has happened kind of online through Instagram and everything. And uh, now is the third number, and uh, we connected many artists from here and nice but i can't wait to make the party you know <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna happen sometime i think i hope so we're at we got about 15 minutes left i wanna um and we can end early too but I just want to make sure because there's a 30 second delay between what we're saying and what's happening on YouTube. Um, so I just want to make sure that anybody who's watching, um, if they have a comment or if they have a question or if they want to, you know, share an anecdote or how they're feeling, um, to please put it in the chat and then I can, I can bring it up. Um, but to speak to your point about party, Cecile, yes. <laughs> Sometimes you watch something that happened before the pandemic and you're at like they're at a club or they're at a bar or they're at a having a dinner party at their house and it feels really strange to watch it yeah but i, I sometimes I, I feel like i have i'm jealous you know of the actors i'm like oh look they're having a party you know it's it's so weird I, I, I truly, I tr truly is something that, because I, I'm surprised because I normally, it's not that I am autistic, but I really own my own and I have no problem with it. But I felt so important that when you want to see someone, you can do it. And now it's just, you can't. And this is a pretty big shift. I'm also pretty independent and I think that I mean, I probably would be anyhow, but I think the combination of being an only child and my experiences of, you know, growing up in the woods of Canada, I became really good at, at sort of occupying myself. Um, but yeah, there, I, I, I also, and I think it's just missing people, but also the spontaneity of it. Um, but it, and it, I don't know if it's an and or, but I certainly, so I, I am by and large working from home. Um, and I would say that without Slack, <laughs> my life and my work life would be so much different. But the, the, the sort of numerous waves of, um, I suppose, virtual communication, I can't imagine this time period without them. And again, here, case in point of what we're doing right now, um, it, it, it does, in my opinion, make things so just massively better. Does anybody want to say any? Oh, wait, we have. 
we have a comment. <laughs> Jerry Allen. Uh, thanks for commenting, Jerry. They say, what is something that you embrace as part of your own identity now? And given all that you've shared about aspects that become a part of your identities and given our new COVID world. I feel like for me, it's both an, an embracing, embracement. I'm sure there's a better word, um, whatever the uh, phrase is, but I've realized the extent of my perfection and also the extent to which that isn't possible and that I should really be rejecting that. Um, and I've, I've really um, reveled, I think, in uh, seeing others reject it and that's sort of reinforced. But it's, it's okay not to be perfect and you can get a lot more from from not trying. I mean, try, yes, but don't try necessarily to be perfect. So I don't know if I actually completely answered or completely <laughs> failed to answer the question. Um, yeah, no, I think that's great. It's a, it's a little bit of letting go, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You held that as really part of your identity and now just kind of releasing. Yeah. I think for me, for both what I was sharing more personally, but then also in this current time and, uh, you know, we were talking about grief and loss so much is that it feels like there's a flip side of that too, where I have felt more empowered, right? It's like I can kind of self-create or it's up to me to kind of decide how I want to identify or there are, you know, it's like no matter who you are and how you're raised or your kind of family structure, what you came in with and, and your experiences, it's like you're always allowed to reject parts of those or like embrace certain things or, or find other, you know, modes or kind of setups that are healthier for you or fit better so yeah I think at this point I'm I it's like going back to that kind of freedom or kind of like self-sovereignty of yeah being able to to decide for yourself and that I mean also in the bigger sense like I like that principle like that's that's permission we should also like encourage in others or you know grant people that permission it's that they are empowered to kind of decide for themselves or feel that they're able to you know to not just kind of have to deal with what's been kind of thrown on them or something For me, like, uh, I think the pandemic has also made me think about um, the possibility of my own death or like if the, it was really, you know, the end of the world or the end of the world as I knew it, as I know it, and uh, <clears throat> what would I do? I mean, how, I remember at the beginning, it was really something that occupied my mind what would I do if this was the end of the world, you know? How did, what things I would do? And uh, I actually, <laughs> it's, it's really funny because uh, I actually, there's nothing that I really, you know, like, and because you're not allowed to do because some people, if they, you know, like see, you know, the world or travel or whatever but things that you can do on your own on uh, in your house you know so the end of the world is you know here you alone in your house what you're gonna do and uh, yeah i think uh, being creative and working with creativity and i mean it, it really makes peace in my mind and i think i'm really i feel really lucky to have this 
in way to be, you know, working, thinking about what's important to me. And, there's not so much projection it's more about what i'm doing today and not about like yeah i'm gonna do that to do an exhibition tomorrow it's more about i'm gonna do that because it's making me happy right now and it makes me going through the day and it puts my mind in order and it makes me think about the important things i want to be aware of while i'm living which is you know connections and life and love and so I think it's more about that, how the process of creativity is really filling my life and not not so what I'm doing or what I'm gonna do with that. And I think pandemic has made me more aware of it. <clears throat> because actually living is just spending time doing things. <laughs> We've only got a couple of minutes left, but um, I really resonated with the idea of now when you're making work, Cecile, that it's you're not necessarily thinking about an exhibition or this like larger project, that it's really about helping or helping you cope um, with what's going on right now. And it seems like it's much more of focus as like personal art making. Um, I don't know, for me, art making is always personal, but I but yeah, but there's always kind of this thought of how it fits in with my larger body of work or, um, yeah, I'm wondering if Laura and George have found that they're working similarly where it's more personal. I would say that at first, absolutely. Um, and then after a while, it became sort of, I don't know if self-reflective is the word, word, but I became aware of the fact that I was doing something new and different. And I started, started trying to do more stuff that was like that. And I've recently come to that realization and I'm trying to go back to a point of just doing something because it felt like the thing to do. That's so kind of like an art. Yeah, same here. Um, a lot of the writing I've been working on this year has much more just been like in the moment, like kind of my emotions or observations of things going on. And it's interesting because I think, because I, I've written a lot of like fiction is often what I tend to work in. I think in a strange way, I feel more empowered now to just be like, well, this is my story. I think I think it's, if nothing else, it's like a nice historical artifact. Um, whereas I think at times I struggled with like, is my experience like interesting to other people or what What do I have to offer? But um, both feeling more empowered in that way, but also like less concerned too, maybe of just like, well, this is what I'm going through and I just want to document it and like, we'll see what, I, what it turns into or, you know, there's always editing for that, but, but just like kind of having it have more value to me, like just inherent value instead of kind of having to justify it or kind of, like you said, like put it in context of what I've created before, what other people have created or something. It's funny because I just remember and I, I, I did forgot why I started to make the big pieces at home. And the thought was, oh, I always wanted to make something big. If I die tomorrow, I'm gonna, you know, make, I'm gonna make it here. And it wasn't really, I mean, it was really unreasonable because really I have a problem to move it now. But, but at the moment it was like, yeah, if I'm gonna die, at mm. least I'm, you know, I make big before I die. Some things like that. Yeah, now I remember. I, I did forgot. Now you made me think about it. Yeah, I think I have that that sense of urgency, and I um, I certainly, in terms of connection to family, um, 
and the recipient of stories of people who grew up, for instance, during World War II and listening to them and hearing them tell stories in which they were very actively making choices based on the fact how to live their lives, whether it was <laughs> skipping school to go see the symphony because that seemed like a better thing to do because you didn't know if you would live the next day. And I, I feel like I've never had, that's never been something that I've thought of before. This is the first time I've had that sense of urgency and, and you know, making those sorts of choices. By comparison, I think most of my life choices, not my life choices, but my sort of day-to-day -day choices are, have been quite banal in, in, you know, in contrast to the sort of things I think about now. Okay, I am the keeper of time. Um, so what I would like to do is I would like to do a breathing um, as we go out of this conversation. Um, so if you can make yourself comfortable again, if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, please do so. It'll be the same three breaths, four counts in through your nose, hold for four counts and eight counts out through your mouth. So breathe in through your nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and out through your mouth. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In through your nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and out through your mouth. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Last one, in through your nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and out through your mouth, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I want to thank all three of you for being a part of this and for sharing your lives, your experiences, um, your grief, your emotions. Um, and I want to uh, thank all of you guys who have tuned in as well um, um, for sharing and being a part of this with us. Um, so this is the first session. Um, there's going to be a series. It's, they'll be monthly. Um, the next one will be November 14th. Um, I believe at one o'clock in the afternoon Pacific time. Um, and I have, I'm finishing up the stuff, like confirming details with the participants and so I'll send that out soon. Um, and I also want to remind people to vote. Um, I realize actually now it doesn't have to be in the States. There's many other countries that voting is going on right now. For example, in Chile, they're voting for the, to start the new constitution today. So if you're in Chile, please vote. Um, if you're in the United States and can vote here, um, November 3rd is our election when there's mail-in ballots. So please get to that. I don't know if in Spain you've got any voting in the elections coming up soon. Uh, it's going to be next year. Okay. Well, but pay attention and vote when you can. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's important. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to close this out and then um, I'll upload it to YouTube uh, as an archive. Say goodbye. Bye. Now it's by YouTube instead of by <laughs> YouTube.